Nevada, middle of the desert. You are an Air Force officer on guard duty. You've been vectored to check on something suspicious, and you're confident you can deal with anything in your way. After all, you and your wingman ride some of the most advanced equipment money can buy. You're fast, brave, you know your stuff. But something isn't right. You haven't noticed it yet, but there's a problem. A team of bogeys on your six. They're low and fast. They snuck in under the radar and breached the perimeter like it was nothing. By the time you see them, it's already too late. There's no hope. No maneuvers, decoys, or tricks can save you. The enemy knew every move you'd make before you made it. They're smarter, faster, and more resourceful. You should have been prepared, but you weren't. And that's it. You're done. You had no chance, really. It wasn't even an honorable dogfight. Lucky for you... <clears throat> Lucky for you, this was just a training exercise. Nobody got killed. The attackers were a red team. Skilled operators brought in specifically to test your skills. Oh, and another important small detail, the fight wasn't in the air, it was entirely in cyberspace. The red team weren't pilots, they were hackers, just like you. They breached the perimeter of the airbase by finding a vulnerability in your system. And they shot you down not with a missile, but with some well-targeted malware. It's just that visualizing this attack with a bunch of fighter jets instead of guys sitting at their desks was a bit more attention grabbing. And there's one more solid reason it makes sense to illustrate hacking with a fighter jet sequence. It's because of these pilots that we have the single coolest cybersecurity practice, red teaming. How? Well, ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts because we're about to dive into something really crazy. The origins of red teaming. Yeah, you heard me right. Red teaming might be the single coolest practice in cybersecurity. You know why? Because it lets you be the bad guy. The core idea is to teach people to protect themselves from a cyber attack. And that teaching process involves literally staging the attack as it would happen in real life. A team of licensed villains just comes in, hacks stuff, and gets paid for that. I know this sounds insane, but that's really what happens. These days, red teaming is a huge market with lots of companies working in it, and nearly every major cybersecurity company has a special squad of red teamers. It's a $5 billion industry and forecasted to grow twice over in the next five years. Red teaming is also a career that's all but designed to employ former criminal hackers, former black hats. Get tired of breaking the law and looking over your shoulder 24 seven? Well, there's a niche where you can do exactly what you did before, only legally and without actually breaking the law and hurting people. Red teaming is one of the cornerstones of modern cybersecurity, and it's growing and becoming more important day by day. But not many people know that this whole industry owes its existence to the military. The first red teamers literally lifted the concept from an Air Force exercise. And not just any random exercise, the largest and coolest exercise of them all, red flag. All right, this is the perfect moment to hit the subscribe button. Believe it or not, this video was not sponsored by the Air Force, any red teaming companies, or Canon Films. We wouldn't be able to make the content we make without the attention of our viewers, so if you find our videos interesting, let us and the algorithm know it, and we'll keep making more. Thanks. I'm gonna make a wild guess that if you've clicked on this video, you probably think cybersecurity is cool. And it is cool. But you know what else is cool? Fighter jets. Just look at them. Have you ever really thought about how awesome these things are? I mean, they're basically giant controlled explosions with a pilot on top. Back during the Cold War, both the Soviets and the Americans agreed. And that's why they both worked to make their fighter jets bigger and faster. More explosions, bigger radars, larger missiles, just as much power and tech as you can get. This approach was tailor-made for one thing, global thermonuclear war a war that would be fought at orbital speeds and intercontinental distances. And then Vietnam happened. The American planes in standard use, like the F-4 Phantom here, came in packing. The biggest engines, the most powerful radars, all the missiles you can eat. Had the enemy shown up with similar aircraft for an equal fight, the Phantoms would have wiped the runway with them, but the enemy didn't. North Vietnamese MiGs were outdated, Many of them even lacked radars, 
and their missiles were decade-old knockoffs, so they would have to stay below the radar, use the terrain to hide, sneak in from all kinds of places. They would also provoke Americans into close-range dogfights. The new generation of American pilots just didn't have the training in this kind of combat, because with all their fancy new long-range missiles and radars, it was thought to be obsolete. For a good chunk of the Vietnam War, the U.S. military was barely able to keep a positive win-to-loss ratio in air-to-air -air engagements against an opposing air force that was, on paper, completely outdated. And that's because Vietnamese military commanders were thinking outside the box. If American generals wanted to turn things around, they'd have to step out of it too. They understood that from then on, their training had to change. To win fights moving forward, their pilots would have to be prepared for everything. Dogfighting, ambushes, fights with multiple opponents, and against opponents that just won't do what you want them to. Fighting aircraft that fly differently than yours, and pilots that employ tricks that you wouldn't expect. This new type of training came to be known as dissimilar air combat training. You've probably seen some of it in one famous motion picture. You know the one. Sorry, I have to keep talking over it because otherwise we're gonna get a copyright strike, but if you clicked on this video, you probably recognize that soundtrack from like two notes. Dissimilar combat training was one of the main teaching techniques in the US Navy's Top Gun training program, which was just like other similar while less Hollywoodized programs. But none of them took this type of training as far as the U.S. Air Force's Red Flag. Red Flag is the biggest aviation exercise ever, basically a real-world air war with hundreds of pilots trying to one-up each other. It started in 1975 with this guy, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Moody Souter, who developed the program because he wanted the pilots to experience something as close to real combat as possible. Early red flags were more or less sporadic dogfights between a few dozen pilots, but over the years it's grown into a complex, weeks-long event that takes place every few months. And it's not just pilots anymore. Ground control, radar control, mission control, ground support, personnel from all different American military branches, and all sorts of allies from around the world. With thousands upon thousands of people and hundreds of aircraft duking it out over the desert, it really is the biggest and baddest aviation exercise in the entire world. The whole duking it out thing is simulated, though. They don't shoot at each other for real, obviously. The maneuvers are real, but the hits and misses are all calculated in software. The enemies are also simulated, but there's something very interesting about them. They're called aggressors and played by some of the very best pilots in the world, real masters, and their goal is to fight like they're not expected to fight to not play by the rules. No, their goal is to play dirty, to use tactics and techniques you wouldn't expect from an honorable opponent. Fly like an enemy that fights for its life. Sneaking, deception, any unconventional tactic you can imagine. They are the Red Team, the incarnation of the lessons learned in Vietnam. Their goal is to make it so that if, and let's hope it's if and not when, the pilots get into a real fight, there's absolutely nothing that can surprise them. And this is where we get back to the cybersecurity part of our story. This kind of exercise, you know, the kind with one side pretending to be the enemy, didn't exist in cybersecurity back then. I mean, cybersecurity itself was still pretty much in its infancy during the 80s and 90s. And the term red teaming wasn't really used beyond the military at all. It would take some time for the hackers to start using it. Fun fact, most hackers back in the day wouldn't get caught dead using military lingo. When it came to politics, those guys were somewhere between digital punks and straight-up honest-to-God anarchists. Also, military terms in general just weren't as widespread as they are now. People weren't checking their six or anything like that back then. You can thank your Call of Duties and Black Hawk Downs for popularizing that. Even so, the military world and the hacker world still had one point of contact. And by contact, I mean the hacker stuff kept bleeding into the military stuff. So much so that the military could no longer afford to ignore it. In the late 80s, the American research and military networks were hacked by a foreign adversary for the first time. Crazy story. Where did you see this? That's classified. It's what? It's classified. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Just kidding, we made a whole video about it. Turns out the whole military was embarrassed by a bunch of German teenagers who worked for the KGB. Definitely worth a watch. Anyway, so the military has to address the hacking angle somehow, and around the mid-90s, an interesting idea pops up. There were several expert assessments at the time where people versed in cybersecurity were asked, 
what would they do to improve the informational warfare capabilities of the United States? And what they recommended was exactly the same thing the military learned in Vietnam. Create a hacker aggressor force. Use the red flag playbook. Let the aggressors play dirty like the real bad guys would. Set them loose and see what happens. Instead of a simulated air war, organize a simulated cyber war. What happened next went down in history as Operation Eligible Receiver 97. Eligible Receiver 1997 was a JCS-sponsored no-notice interoperability exercise. A special aggressor squadron was created from around 40 guys from the National Security Agency. They were the most dangerous cybersecurity experts the agency could find. People who could do exploit development, network intrusion, social engineering. Most of these terms didn't even apply back then. Nobody was putting them on their resumes. But that doesn't mean there were no people dabbling in them. And some of the best of those people worked for the NSA. We know quite clearly how to take the DII down and how to attack the United States in an information warfare campaign. Opposite them were the blue team, the good guys. Except nobody told them they were the blue team. They were just your regular military cybersecurity personnel doing their regular jobs, not even remotely suspecting that they were participating in an exercise. Per usual, they would have to monitor networks, report and contain any breaches, and protect the sensitive data just like any other day at the office. For the red team, the rules were simple. For two weeks, you can do anything you want to break American military and civilian infrastructure without actually breaking it. You can use all the means non-military hackers have. You know, regular exploits and vulnerabilities that people are sharing online. Please try not to do any irreversible damage and try not to break any American laws if you can, but other than that, anything goes. The exercise was supposed to last two weeks. It lasted four days. You know why? It was a massacre. Imagine letting experienced aggressor pilots loose on a bunch of rookies fresh out of flight school. A simulated massacre, but a massacre nonetheless. At first, the hackers were supposed to see how resilient the American electricity grid and emergency communication systems were. In theory, a hostile force might see them as great targets for a digital terror attack. So how easy would it be to leave the entire United States of America without power and emergency services? Well, very easy. The NSA aggressors infiltrated pretty much every server they wanted and stopped just short of destroying the entire freaking economy of the USA. And the blue team was powerless to stop them. The second step was checking how resilient the military's communications were. You know, just in case World War III kicked off and the enemy decided to do some digital snooping. Were they resilient? No. The hackers infiltrated military email servers and began intercepting classified messages. This time, somebody actually noticed them and tried notifying security. The hackers just intercepted the email with that notification and made it disappear. Several days later, the whole Red Team offensive had to be stopped early because there was nothing more to learn. As one of the NSA attackers said, We pretty much had the blue team uh, on the run by the, the third day of the actual exercise, so the need to play all of our capability wasn't there. We only played about 30% of, of what we could have. The, the message there is it could have been a lot worse. Anything beyond that 30% would have been like shooting at an aircraft that's already plunging into the ground in a giant fireball. A good illustration of how utterly embarrassing the whole experience was? In this report to the President of the United States, the military claimed Operation Eligible Receiver lasted three months before it exposed how vulnerable the military networks were. Again, in reality, it was four days they had to report it like that to save face. So yeah, this was the very first case of red teaming tactics being used in cyberspace. It was devastating, but it also showed how invaluable this sort of approach was for preparing cybersecurity personnel to defend against cyber attacks. And this lesson was learned basically thanks to some painful experiences back in Vietnam. If that hadn't happened, if the military hadn't implemented and popularized dissimilar training, and if that approach hadn't been implemented and applied to cybersecurity, then the world would probably look very different today. Of course, fast forward a couple decades and we now have cybersecurity red teaming everywhere. It's a massive industry where some of the best hackers in the world are being hired to reenact red flag on anything that can be hacked. Any firm worth its money will regularly undergo security checks by aggressor teams from specialized companies. There are people who get paid massive sums of money for literally robbing banks and taking down other services too. 
in simulated and carefully constructed circumstances, of course, but still by using every unconventional trick they can muster, because that's what real hackers would do. Cybersecurity red teaming even branched out into a multitude of its own disciplines. There are red teamers who break into networks the old-fashioned way. Typically, they use the same techniques regular hackers would use, from SQL injections to distributing malware. They exploit known vulnerabilities, try finding out what holes the target systems have, and so on. Then there are the red teamers who use social engineering. Well, most red teamers use social engineering, and most hackers use it too, but some make more use of it than others. Because humans are the weakest link of every security system. What can be more effective than convincing your target to install malware themselves, or tricking them into revealing their password? Sure, it's not honorable, it's not real hacking, but real hackers do this every day, so red teamers have to do it too. And of course, there are red teamers who take the physical game to the next level. They're called penetration testers, and they literally work like those heist crews you see in the movies. They physically infiltrate the areas that are difficult to hack from the outside. The goal is to reach the internal networks after bypassing real-world security. Think Mission Impossible stuff, but entirely legal. Even bug bounty hunting is sort of connected to red teaming. Many companies openly offer bounties to those who can hack their products. If you do manage to do that and explain to the company how you did it, you can sometimes get a sizable sum of money. People build entire careers out of that. Of course, all of that, all of red teaming, rests on one thing. Trust. Red teamers are professionals. They have to uphold their reputations and help their clients to improve their security, not just show off how cool they are. So just like each training mission ends with a debrief, each red teaming exercise culminates in a thorough rundown of lessons learned. And here's another fun fact. The military still does red teaming too, all the time. Except after the fiasco of eligible receiver 97, we just don't get to hear about the results very often. In a pretty cool twist of fate, even the red flag exercise now includes a giant cybersecurity red teaming section, where teams of hackers attack bases at the exact same time as the pilots fighting it out in the skies over Nevada. How cool is that? <clears throat> Picture this. Nevada, middle of the desert. You are an Air Force officer on guard duty. You sit by your computer stations monitoring network traffic. There was some suspicious activity, but you're confident you can deal with anything in your way. After all, you and your wingman run some of the most advanced security software money can buy. You're fast, brave, you know your stuff, but something isn't right. You haven't noticed yet, but there's a problem. A team of bogeys on your six. They're low, fast. They snuck in under the radar, breached the perimeter like it was nothing. So, are you prepared this time? Remember I said the fighter jet version sounds better? Nah, come on. The cybersecurity one sounds pretty cool too. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you had half as much fun watching this video as we did making it. We have lots of similar, less military videos about other hacking stories, so definitely go check out the explainer playlist on the channel. Thanks, and over and out.